Good morning, everyone. And happy Halloween. Some of you are looking particularly festive. I think it's terrific. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce today's grand round speakers, um, Dr. Cynthia Mor uh, Morris. Dr. Morris is the vice chair and professor of medical informatics and clinical epidemiology, as well as a professor of medicine, um, public health and preventative medicine at the um, Oregon Health Sciences uh, University. She's also the co-PI of the Oregon Clinical and Translational Research Institute, which is their CTSA-funded program. Dr. Morris um, did her undergraduate training at Portland State University, receiving a BS in both psychology and biology. She then went up uh, I-95 to the University of Washington, where she got first her MPH in epidemiology and then her PhD in epidemiology. Um, Cindy is recognized as a national leader in clinical research education for their CTSA program, which they call Oak Tree. Um, she directs the Education and Career Development Program. She's the co-PI of the TL1 Award, and she um, has developed and directs their Master's of Clinical Research degree in clinical science. In addition, um, she's also um, the, the Oregon uh, site PI for um, Build Exito, which is a training grant to increase diversity in the research workforce. She's mentored more than 40 individuals um, in um, in a variety of grants, including F2s, T32s, KO1s, um, and K23 grants. And under her direction, the total number of career development awards at, at Oregon um, has increased many folds with a strong record in achieving research uh, independence. For her efforts, she has been awarded uh, in 2004 the Mentor Award from the Medical Research Foundation. She's received the highest awards in education and mentoring from um, Oregon Health Sciences. In 2006, the Faculty Excellence Award for Education, and in 2007, the John Resco Award for Faculty Research and Mentoring. She's been um, the president of the uh, what is now the Association for Clinical and Translational Science, and as well as the program chair. From a scholarly perspective, um, Cindy's a clinical epidemiology with widely respected methodolo methodologic expertise in registry, networks, cohort studies, and clinical trials. She's been NIH supported for more than 30 years. She founded and maintains the Oregon Registry of Congenital Heart Defects, a population-based registry that has more than 5,000 individuals that are being followed for the natural history of their disease. She's led data, uh, a data coordinating center for more than 20 years responsible for major multi-center clinical trials. So today, Cindy is here to talk to us about listening to the patient and the family voice in designing clinical research. Please give Cindy a warm welcome. Cindy, welcome. Thank you. All right, I, I'm not sure I recognize that person. Um, <laughs> and for those of you who can't tell, I, my costume today is epidemiologist, so <laughs> I went really basic. Um, so I think I am required to show you the picture of our, our campus. We are the only medical school campus that has a ski lift, so actually a gondola that connects the upper campus to the lower campus. This is obviously an old picture because that lower campus is fully developed now with new buildings opening all the time. All right. <clears throat> so listening to the voice of the patient and the family in designing clinical research. And this is something I think that has evolved for many of us. I know in, in studies that I designed maybe even as recent as 10 years ago, this was not necessarily part of what we did and what we thought about in planning the trial. So I want to talk today about what is the important concept in doing this. How can you use the family and the patient voice in research? What does it tell you? How does it change what you design? <clears throat> in particular, I want to speak about the health, um, health experiences research network, which I think is a new methodology <clears throat> for really being able to amplify that voice. Okay. One of the pleasures, I think, of, of mentoring is when the people that you mentor become your colleagues. And that's the case here. I know from nothing about atopic dermatitis, but I work with a pediatric dermatologist who has, um, who about 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, had this idea that he wanted to develop that simple barrier protection in infants when, when started early <clears throat> might present, prevent atopic dermatitis from developing. So on 
on and on. He, he ended up publishing in 2014, was funded by a K-23 award to do this work, that in fact, daily emollient use reduced the risk of developing atopic dermatitis by about 50% in, um, in infants and families who are at high risk. So in thinking about that, so what comes next? Well, what comes next? is trying to figure out if, if you did this in a larger community, if you, apply, if you um, studied, in fact, does applying this daily barrier protection, would, pay, would parents do it? Would it be effective if you did this in all infants? So thinking about this, um, Eric, Eric Simpson wanted to plan a community-based but pragmatic clinical trial. So we wanted to sit down and think, okay, what do we need? What do we need to know to design this trial? Well, we thought, okay, so first of all, what outcome is most important to parents? What aspect of atopic dermatitis really bothers parents the most? Would parents accept randomization? So your first visit after birth to a pediatrician or to your family practice doctor being asked to participate in a clinical trial? Would parents accept advice about bathing their infant on a routine basis? Would they accept advice that may be a little bit different than the usual? And how would families, just really pragmatic, how do families want to be contacted? So how do we get information back from here. So we did this the usual way. You know, in the old days, we would sit with the PI, it's Eric Simpson, he probably won't like that picture being up here, and a bunch of data wonks and people who do clinical trials, a little bit like me, we'd sit around a conference table. So we added a couple people. We added a representative from the National Eczema Association. And we added representatives from a practice-based research network that extends across the U.S. called Metalark. So individual pediatricians and community practice and uh, family practice docs from all around the country, we all sat around a table, metaphorically, and planned the study. Okay, so what did we learn? We learned this. What was the most important thing to parents? The representative from the National Eczema Society said, it's sleep, it's sleep disturbance. Would parents accept randomization? Yes, and so we're about 100 patients into this trial, and I can say research literacy is a little bit of an issue that we're working on and dealing with with a number of parents that say, well, that wasn't the, art, the assignment that I wanted. I wanted this side. So that's a bit of an issue. Advi would they accept advice about bathing and personal care? Yeah, they accept it. Well, I don't know if they'll follow it, but that's part of a pragmatic trial. And then would families, how would, how would do families want to be contacted? Hands down, SMS technology, so enabling questions through your cell phone, hands down. Okay, but then now that we're going on this trial, now that we're done with planning, we had an R34 grant to plan it from NIH. Now we have the full uh, multi-center uh, multi clinical trial that's being done in 28 sites around the country. I think one of the things that's been driven home to me is we had a person from the National Eczema Association helping us plan this, this trial, but it's one person. And so the question comes up, who speaks for the community? And that's what I want to talk about. It's usually the loudest person, the person with the loudest voice, the person who really has thought about this um, and feels like they can speak for other parents. The question is, can they really? Can someone who even who works for a community-based organization truly speak for all the different families, all the different voices? 
or oftentimes when you're planning a study, you use a voice of convenience. You use your patient and their family to ask them, well, what would you think about this? But again, it's a single voice. You miss the diversity of voices in the community. You, you miss hearing from people and understanding their motivation for participating in research, how they would like to be contacted. So what I want to talk about today from now on is the Health Experiences Research Network. And I owe a real debt of gratitude to Erica Cottrell, who's a sociologist that, we're, that is leading this project at OHSU through our CTSA, and Kelly Parker, who is a uh, pediatric oncology fellow who is spending a research year working on collecting some of these family interviews and trying to um, uh, use that methodology to design clinical trials in, uh, uh, in uh, cancer treatment in particular. Okay, so going back as far as 2001, this methodology was first used in the UK, was founded uh, by what's called the DITEX, I always have to read this, the DITEX Charity and um, Health Experiences Research Group at Oxford. To me, DIPEX is a little bit like what I clean my coffee pot with when it gets kind of crunchy. Um, but it really stands for a database of individual patient experiences. Um, that's why we call it the Health Experience Research Network, because we decided that DIPEX just doesn't exactly have the best ring. Anyway, but the aims of this um, are really to support pa uh, patients and their families who are facing um, life-altering challenges and to help them understand how to be prepared, a little bit more about how to be prepared for what comes next. To also support health professionals in training to be able to understand from the, the patient perspective, from the patient voice about and to really better provide patient-focused care or family-focused care and to, to promote better communication between health professionals and patients. Okay, so it all started with Ann McPherson, and Ann McPherson uh, was a general practitioner of, of, of uh, some renown in the UK. And when she, she had been working with the Oxford group, and when she developed breast cancer herself, she realized she had access to all these you know, great resources that on causes diagnosis and treatment, but what she didn't have available to her was the patient voice. What is it like to have breast cancer? What is it like to have this? And so that prompted her to co-found a, um, a patient experience website to help address that need. The goal of this is to really be an interdisciplinary academic research center, and indeed that's what has developed dedicated to understanding the attitudes, values, and experiences of people coping with illness and making decisions about their health and how to use that to make a difference. So their methodology is, is relatively simple, it's this. To represent the broadest possible range of perspectives using a rigorous qualitative research method. Because you might say, well, there's lots of patient-focused websites out there. Um, you know, for almost any disease disorder you can think of, there is a patient group that responds to each other and creates their own listserv. But is that always the best way? It's not the most scientific way of collecting opinion. So what they do is for every health condition, they recruit perhaps 30 or more different patients, specifically looking for people of different backgrounds. And they're recruited through a different range of, of avenues so that they can get maximum variation sampling to collect not only what are the common themes, but what are the uncommon themes as well. They continue the interviews until they get, um, until no new, new, uh, new concepts or ideas are arising, you know, saturation. 
Then they go through and they co using the qualitative methodology, they code all the, all the transcripts by theme. They focus on the common and the divergent experiences. And then researchers um, produce these summaries in lay language, and they are illustrated with video, audio, video and audio clips, or and written the written transcript itself. I'm going to show you towards the end um, a video clip. I couldn't find a pediatric focus one, so you'll have to put up with with um, a different a, a different case here. But the modules then are disseminated via a website and publicly available, so that they are accessible both to patients and the public, as well as for secondary analysis to researchers. So this is what it looks like, and this is the one that's developed in the UK. It's called uh, healthtalk.org, and it's hard to read that but because this is just a snap of their website, but there are, what, 20 or so different conditions that have been looked at, anything from chronic health issues to um, all sorts of different environments and different sources. The one that I have paid particular attention to is this one, on clinical trials and medical research. So there are 30 plus interviews from people, from, particularly from young people, about why did I participate in clinical research? What did I get out of it? And I, I think what's truly helpful here is from this website, in particular from this module, is understanding the motivation. Because sometimes we don't necessarily understand why someone chooses to participate in a research study or why they choose not to. So there are a variety of different voices here that I think give rise to that. And you can actually go to the website and hear it in people's own voice. So their dissemination is through three different ways in particular, through this, um, on the far left there, through a data warehouse. All the transcripts, all the video clips are in a searchable data warehouse that you, if you are planning a research study, can go listen to. You can use them, um, in fact, even for um, for scholarly purposes, if you want to use those transcripts with their permission. There's publicly available web modules, like I was showing you on the last page. These have a particularly high traffic. And I, I was told the other day that over half of their traffic in the UK on this website is coming from the US, which I think then tells us all the more we probably need to do this and establish a very similar purpose in the U.S. and why I had to think through why would we need to do this independently in the U.S. Well, part of it is because our healthcare system is certainly different than it is in the U.K. and patients' concerns can be very, very different with regard to their condition or illness because of that. Set. There's also an ex a, a growing, a, a growing peer-reviewed literature that has used the DIPEX methodology or health experience research network to advance this. I think in the end there are probably some multiple uses for this. Um, it's originally created just to be support for the patient. But I think it's a lot more than that. It helps to identify questions and problems that really matter. So again, going back to the example, when we looked at atopic dermatitis, a parent may not care about the, quote, diagnosis, per se, but they do care a lot about sleep disturbance condition. It enhances patient engagement. It really gets um, a more activated group of patients involved. It promotes a more balanced encounter, if you think about it, between the patient and their health care provider. If they're able to, to listen to and access this information via the web. It could be a learning resource for medical students and residents and so on. So this is actually being studied right now, I think it's at Wisconsin, where I'm sure most of you in your training um, use standardized patients. 
So what they're actually trying to see is if use of watching these video clips and reading these transcripts enhances empathy in addition to the standardized patient. I'll be interested in that. Use for quality improvement to shape policy and relevant guidelines and to also, and this is what I want to spend a little bit more time thinking about today, how can you use this methodology to really improve your design of research? So right now in the U.S., there are four partners in the Health Experience Research Network. Um, we're up here in the Northwest. And then there's, um, for those of you who know your states, there's Wisconsin at Madison, and there's Johns Hopkins, and there's Yale. And so we are um, partnered in trying to really advance the first module from the Health Experience Research Network in the U.S. Here's their uh, steering committee, in case you know anyone on there. Here's what we've done to date. And this we is very generous for me to even say that because this is really the work in particular at Oregon of two colleagues, Mark Heltan, who was part of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Initiative uh, Methods Board and really helped promote the use of this methodology uh, for PCORI in particular. And then um, Erica Cottrell, like I said, the sociologist. So here's what's been done. We've um, completed modules on, and they're posted, on depression in young adults from Madison and on veterans with traumatic brain injury. I'll show you a video clip from that. This got, has been getting a lot more press. Um, there was a nice article in the New York Times about this. But I think the one that impressed me the most, there was an article in Ebony about um, the methods and the depression for young adults. And there were a number of people quoted, and this really resonated, I think, that said, I could see video clips of people who looked like me, who sounded like me, who were involved, who uh, talking about their depression. And without that, I might not have thought, um, I, I could see that other people like me thought treatment for depression, and maybe I could. This is what's in development. We're looking at childhood cancer right now, particularly uh, patient and family uh, voices as to the experience of cancer and how their participation in clinical trials has um, influenced has, what their motivation was what it was like, what the experience was like. Genetic screening, breast cancer, uh, go for illness with it. The VA is starting to really invest in this. Um, just clinical trials in general. Uh, I want to do one later on because one of my own uh, personal research areas has been in transition from pediatric care to adult care. Or, pediatric, or really adult congenital heart disease too, or what are the challenges of that? And then this last one is, is open, but because of so much emphasis on, on opioids, we're kind of leaning toward pursuing that the next year. All right, so again, just to review, this is what the, the Health Experience Research Network methods are. We, it's the whole purpose is to amplify patient and caregiver voices in clinical and translational research. So we've taken the um, DIPEC methods and say, okay, understanding is important to have this website for patients can be important, but it's also, we can use it, I think, as better method for patient engagement to help drive research. We're using multiple routes of dissemination, multiple different types of information from website to publication. Um, and the website, we hope, it, or will contain transcripts and video clips too. Okay, so again, if you want to conduct research in the community that matters to patients, we have to know what's most important to them. So understanding the concept of 
impact on quality of life. These are things that are important. I know that it's changed so much of um, multiple sclerosis research in particular, where I think many um, researchers were surprised five plus years ago to find that the thing that mattered the most to patients wasn't necessarily the disability, but was fatigue. So number of research studies now looking at fatigue and the and what can influence that. Many different organizations, as I said, have been calling for a better patient engagement and enhanced community engagement and research. There's obviously limited um, evidence of how best to do this. I know there was a meeting back here at NCAP just a few weeks ago talking specifically about this. There's always barriers to incorporating patient perspectives, values, preferences, and so on. But I think a lot of what we're doing right now, I really think this word is important, is can be a little tokenistic. We did that ourselves. Um, you know, when we were designing this study on atopic dermatitis, we thought a spokesman for the organization could be our, quote, token for community engagement. And I'm not sure that was the right method, the right thing to do. So what we are doing now, we are trying to capture this wide range of experiences and priorities. We're empowering patients to give voice to their story and also to decide how they want to share their data. Do they just want to share the transcript? Are they willing to share the audio? Or are they willing to share their, a true video? And we're trying to also bring in voices that wouldn't have been heard otherwise. And I think when I show you a couple of video clips, you'll see the, the range of people involved in that. And again, to go from voice, single voice, to voices, to synthesize themes and then to disseminate to a broader audience. So I think it can be used for clinical and translational research in a variety of different ways to illuminate the health experiences of patients and caregivers from special populations. So one of the things, as an example, that we're looking at in, um, in our childhood cancer module that we're creating now, Oregon's a rural state once you get east of I-5, the I-5 corridor that runs to Vancouver, up to Seattle and Vancouver, and down to Sacramento. I can't forget California. Um, I the Golden State's in the house, I see it. So there you go, you're represented. Um, so once, so Oregon's rural, and our patients often have to travel five to six hours to Portland to get care. And so the experience of families with cancer, families who have a child with cancer who live in a really, some of the really remote or rural areas of Oregon is different than someone who lives five miles from the medical school. <laughs> so we're trying to capture all those choices. Trying to augment current um, community engagement by giving researchers access to this wide variety of voices, enabling researchers to understand patient experience of what it's like to participate in a clinical trial, highlighting what issues are the most important to patients and their families, any gaps in research and anything that's unexplored. And then also trying to think about how we uh, would measure and collect patient reported outcomes. So we are in the process of creating this record of stories from patients and their families to better understand the experience of childhood cancer and the impact of the illness. Trying to both, we can use that, we think, to inform research going forward. We're collecting interviews of parents in particular, and there have been some um, on their experience with diagnosis, treatment, and so on, and survivorship. So we're trying to collect anywhere between 35 and 50. We're doing English speaking only. But I think there's a lot of work to be done here in the future uh, to collect voices from families who do not speak English in particular. So we're, um, we're trying, this is our demographic here that you're looking at. The interviews are one to two hours long, and they, they're often done, usually done, in the family home. 
so the family's more relaxed in doing that. And if children want to be interviewed, well, we give them an opportunity to, and these have been some of the most powerful and interesting ones collected to date. We're also, um, with a great deal of sensitivity, approaching parents whose child has died from a childhood cancer and working uh, to collect their interviews as well. And everybody gets a $50 gift card if they participate. So what part of this is this maximum variation of sampling, right? So we're trying to get the widest variety of experiences. Like I said, we're trying to collect rural patients, patients from very different backgrounds, from people of means to people who are very much disadvantaged in the process. There's this two-tier consent approach. So we get, they, we get their consent to participate in an interview, and then there's a second level of how can we use the materials from you that we've collected, and we do that at the end. Like I said, can we use the full audio, the video, or the, just the transcript? Anything is okay. And patient, or parent, um, parents are free to stop at any point if they feel uncomfortable in the situation and they have control on how we use their data. Primarily, do, we're doing all these different methods, clinic-based recruitment. Providers are sending letters to their patients inviting them to participate. We use the waiting room. We use the community. We use community-based organizations, including this one called OCEAN that works nationwide and it's a, it's a um, practice-based research network of safety net clinics across the U.S. So we are using uh, a number of these on the East Coast, so I think a little more, bit more up in New England and perhaps in the South, um, to increase that diversity of voices that we're hearing. We're also using social media to advertise, so Twitter, Facebook, all those sort of online forums, and just trying to to get the word out to a variety of different pe uh, uh, people and also to have a personal approach in inviting people as much as possible to generate that trust. Okay, I, I think I get the last one. Um, and so this is what our products are, this health experience research repository that will be indexed for use by researchers and these web modules, topic summaries that will be written and illustrated. What I want to show you now, if I can get it to work. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll use some help on this too. I can't read, I can't see the cursor. I wanna go into a, look at the video clip, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kept putting the mouse on there. Perfect. So go to that one, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Perfect. Thank you. So this is... Um, TBI in veterans, probably as unlike any population to show at a pediatric grand round that I could. But I think what you'll notice what you'll notice here when I put this on is this is a little different voice than you might hear. Otherwise, if you were to go to a TBI group or other other way of recruiting people. My problem is my memory. You know, and it really does. It. I took a ten dollar an hour pay cut in January because I'm forgetting to call customers. I'm forgetting to call insurance companies. I'm forgetting which customer said what day he was going to be available. I'll have a conversation with somebody in the truck. Um, you know, I got my little my little hands free thing, and I can't write anything down, obviously. So I'll have a conversation with the customer. Say, okay, you know what? Tomorrow two o'clock. That sounds good. I'll be available. Okay, great. So I got you down, Mr. Smith, for tomorrow two o'clock. Awesome. Hang up with him, get to my destination five, eight, ten minutes later, whatever. Uh, who the hell did I talk to? I don't remember which customer that was. Or, oh, that was Mr. Smith. When did he say he was going to be available? Was that tomorrow or the day after? I don't remember. 
and um, and and so and so I'll have to call the customer back, which is really obnoxious um, for the customer anyway. Uh, you know, like, what time did I do? It? Um, it makes me look like an idiot. All right, here's a here's another one. My problem is well, no, no, that's the same one. Here's another one. And then when I talk to people, I'd search for words in my head. Um, I'd lose words. Uh, I start losing words, and, and like the Arabic uh, translation for friend, there's two, there's two words for friend, and uh, which was the most appropriate in this this conversation that I was searching for, and I could see them written in my brain, but I could not uh, extract it out of the brain, and I could not articulate, so I was losing my language, uh, my languages, and. Uh, so uh, I went through a year of cognitive therapy, a year of vestibular therapy, I, uh, speech therapy. I stuttered. Um, only did I lose my language, but I stuttered, and the stuttering got worse. Um, the aphasia, whatever way you search for words, even in English, it got. I mean, I lost all my languages, all of them. And then English was the last to go. So it like Arabic first, then French, then Farsi, then sign, then English. Gone. Yeah, so again, different stories, different people, and that's, that's the advantage of doing it this way. So let me bring up, I want to do poll everywhere. I'm told you guys do this, so um, pull out your cell phones. I mean, this is the first time you always hear, you know, put your cell phone away. Pull out your cell phones, and we're going to engage in this. Um, the Pediatric, um, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't, maybe we won't, maybe we're going to try this one other way, see if it comes up, I'm logged in, it should be okay, yeah, well, it was a nice it was a nice try. Um, the questions are, are, are these, and maybe I can take it out in a different way and engage um, some of you in thinking about what I have them up here. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to know about are these. What do you think some of the barriers are to really incorporating the family and patient voice in research? Now, I'm going to feed you some questions and we can have this discussion. Um, what do you think is the most important way that a, a more um, in-depth understanding of the patient and family voices can inform research? In other words, how can we use this information from the Health Experiences Network to really change what we do? How can we use it in, different, in a different way? Does it have a role in, undergrad, in education, in medical education? Um, and then also thinking about we'd also like at the, at the end here, and I don't have a way to show this except just to say, well, maybe I can actually pull this slide up, is that we are interested if you are no yeah if you if you are a pediatric oncologist we are interested as well in recruiting you to participate in our evaluation of current pediatric cancer clinical trials and how we can improve them and improve the methodology it's okay yeah so you can just uh you can get in touch with me directly, and I will make sure that, that that information gets to the study team. So let's just open this up to, to questions via the normal route rather than trying to do it through an enhanced route. So how do you think this can be used? What questions do you have? Sure. Thank you. 
Yeah, you know, we are not far enough along with the interviews right now at this point. We are only about a third of the way through the interviews, so I haven't read the transcripts to know that and to understand the motivation, but that's obviously a, a key component. Um, I think oftentimes it's a, you know, we need to better understand the value of altruism. Also, the, I, I'm really interested in um, research literacy in the public, and do parents really understand that with a clinical trial, there are odds that, that whatever treatment you're delivering will have no effect or could potentially cause harm as well as having a benefit. I think the benefit always gets the high side and high stuff. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. 5,000, 50,000 becomes, you know, uh, a nightmare. Yeah. And so transcripts yeah. help. Yeah. But then are you then indexing against yes. the back end ontology of some type? Yes, it's all index. It, it will all be indexed. Every video, every transcript will be indexed by theme. So as an ex just some specific, and it is in the uh, UK website, and I really urge you to, or if you're interested in this, take a look at the UK website as well. But um, <clears throat> in particular, let's say a, video, a transcript has a theme of uh, family impact on um, the child's education. Education would be a, a index versus someone who really talks about this was my motivation, this was our motivation for participating in a clinical trial index. So when you pull clinical trials, you may pull across several different concepts as well. Yeah, I think indexing is a key thing. You mentioned that in your interviews to date, you have, for the atopic dermatitis, um, had some really good qualitative data about how parents want to be approached. And you touched on the issue of research literacy. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, it's sort of two related questions. Mm -hmm. One, is there something that's generalizable about how parents want to be um, first alerted to the fact that there's a clinical trial that their children might be um, eligible for, whether it is an at-risk two-month-old, there's no disease right now, or it's a child with cancer who's currently being mm -hmm. treated. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And the second mm -hmm. thing is that is there a stratification based on any factors that you might identify, research literacy, the, the people's socioeconomic status, um, the kind of issue you're talking about, an acute issue versus a chronic mm -hmm. issue that distinguishes mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, there's an expression, you had me at hello. You can also lose people oh, at hello yeah. if you don't yeah. initiate the conversation in a thoughtful and intentional way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so if you think about it, I've, I've shown you two examples. We looked at atopic dermatitis and we looked at cancer. So I'm going to go back to atopic dermatitis. Frankly, the concerns of the study team were more about the community clinicians than they were at the time of designing this study about the patients of those clinicians. And I think we got led down that pathway because we had a multiplicity of voices from community clinicians who said, I don't have time to be involved in this. I don't really care about atopic dermatitis all that much. I don't think it's a high priority for my patients. But then when we talk to, of course, patients particularly, you know, if, if the prevalence is 18%, it's relatively high prevalence. So when we talk to patients who had a family member affected, they felt quite differently. How did they want to be approached? So for that study, the clinicians in particular said, I can't be involved in doing this because there's this additional thing that if you as a clinician or a clinic staff are involved in recruiting people for studying, now you have to go through all the compliance 
information and if you and complete all the city training and all that. And if you are a clinician in practice, you may not want to do that. In fact, it was a nightmare scale of 28 clinics times perhaps five people per clinic. And so we were a little not wanting to do that either. But when we talked to parents, parents were fine about engaging with technology. So if we gave them an iPad, the iPad had a video that, that actually um, Eric Simpson did in English and in Spanish that would address the parents, address some of their concerns that they could watch and then read information about the study on the iPad, give consent on the iPad with a backup of being able to call us at a central place to ask any questions. Now we've got a way of doing this. The research staff at the clinical sites are not involved in research, don't have to go through compliance training. But we have the parents from the video that seems to be going quite well. But people seem to like the video and they watch the video. And the number of questions to us hasn't been, it's not been zero, but it's not tremendously high. And the refusal rate has been low to date. So we think for that study, minimal risk that frankly about applying an emollient and bathing practice. Parents accept that. On the other side, studies uh, for any clinical trial for um, uh, cancer, pediatric cancer, it's a very different approach and it's a highly personal approach. And it's a trusted individual. But for low risk, parents, uh, for like for atopic dermatitis, for something that's seen as being relatively innocuous, parents have been pretty pretty good about it. So tailoring the approach to your patient, to the study condition, and really understanding from that how do people want to be approached, what are they okay with? Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, works otherwise. Uh, I just wanted to learn what you are educating me, educating me today. And as far as getting the parents involved, educating them about the project and the research I'm doing, and giving them an option of choosing even randomized study yeah. and the placebo control that may not even be beneficial to their child. Isn't that the purpose of our consent form and what we are already doing yeah. and what what is the difference between what you're telling me sure. today and what I've been doing for the last 30 years? Sure. So I think many of us, when we write that consent form and think this, is, this goes way beyond consent. So this is, consent is an aspect of it, but it's trying to understand and design the trial to gain the highest recruitment rate. So recruitment's the problem in many studies. And to maximize that recruitment rate, so that you're presenting the patient with information that matters to them, and also in particular outcomes that are important to them. So we don't always think about that. We don't always take it from the patient perspective of what those outcomes are. Now, for many of you who are doing um, critical research, critical clinical research in treatment, this may have somewhat less application about motivation and recruiting. But there is a much larger population, I think, that's out there for relative, for other different types of studies. I'll use the, the multiple sclerosis example here. I think, um, and, and this wasn't using this methodology, I'll, I'll admit, but it's really understanding the patient outcomes that matter to that patient and that it may not be the disability, it may not be other elements of that as much as it is just the everyday fatigue. Again, I think that was an example where we learned that the patient concern was much broader than what we had really been thinking. Sure. Go ahead. Um, yes, thank you very much for this very interesting work. Um, uh, can you mention 
um, approaches that you've learned from your patients, from from engaging your your patients and from these data um, that are different than you expected, yeah. um, and that yeah. m might change the approach that you take. And I have another question too. Yeah, I I, I sure can, and um, I think that many of us didn't realize, you know, and, and again, I, I, I honestly think this is a little bit of a generational issue where in the last five years, we've realized nobody wants to be called on their phone. So there is an example um, with a, so we're doing a study right now of, we're, doing, we're in about year six of follow-up of children of um, moms who have smoked during pregnancy and following infant lung function um, to look for the development of asthma. And we realized really early on that this is a population that did not want us to ever call them on their phone. Text, please, text. Or when we said, well, we could use Facebook. It's like, Facebook? No, we're not on Facebook. So really understanding Every aspect, and this is a more of a retention issue, but it also applies, I think, to recruiting, to understanding how people want to communicate and how an 18-year-old or a 21-year-old mom who is couch surfing um, and has an infant wants to be communicated with. It's very different than you or me. And so I think that, that's been one thing. So... Uh... Expanding on Lisa's comment, <clears throat> it strikes me that this is leading you to sort of a Facebook type promotion approach where you're marketing the participation of research is individualized to the characteristics of the particular patient. Are you thinking in those terms and does that, that gets to be very complex. Yes and no. Especially in the, in yeah. the, the uh, IRB yeah. uh, approach and so on. So yes and no. Remember this method. So we are using Facebook and other social media to recruit just for this health information, health uh, research, health experience research network, which is really a compilation of community voices and it's qualitative research. I'm a quantitative researcher. I do more clinical trials. So I don't do, I haven't done a ton of qualitative research in the past. But I think the key message today is that the qualitative method can inform your quantitative approach and your approach to a clinical trial. Um, I have seen clinical trials recruiting if they're trying to recruit widely by more of a social media approach. But I honestly think that there are issues, or there are, I, I would have hesitancy to do that. But so often now we may approach, so we may approach um, people who are not our own patients, okay? We may recruit people in a hospital system via my chart or some other way to talk about participation in a study. So those are approaches we should be thinking about and that start to blur that line of, I know you, you trust me, participate in this study, to figuring out how to, how to expand the population that we get to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, talk. I also wonder, in terms of addressing some of the questions, is elevating the patient voice not only in how they want to participate in trials, but also to identifying the questions that are of most Absolutely. importance to them as one aspect, and also the limitations of our ability to collect the universe of their experience as they participate on the trials, their experience of the illness. Yeah. Do you anticipate uh, additional funding, additional resources that are going to be committed to this? Because this is time-intensive research. Oh, yeah. And, and it has its own rigor and, you know, and generalizability and those kinds of things aren't the same aspect of it. So there's there's hurdles we have, but I do think that these kinds of issues could really change the way we do research in the future. So let me talk about funding for a minute. Um, so 
right now, we are funded through our CTSA. This, for those of you know, who know CTSA parlance, this is our optional module. We're funded to the tune of about 225,000 per year. And this is to, there's an element of travel to go out and do the interviews. And I think there are three, one part-time person and two full-time people, as I remember, funded by this. And then there's money for, you know, IT and so on. Um, Wisconsin is funded similarly and does their optional module. So that gives you an element. We, we will do three modules within five years for about 200000 per year. That's expensive. But I have to say a lot of this is in startup, once we're started up. Um, and also using a, a clinical fellows has been a fantastic thing for us because um, there's certainly a lot of people who are highly interested in that. And so we've been able to incorporate their research here and look to doing that more, but it is expensive. In the UK, this is funded somewhat by Oxford, but it's also an independent charity. And so when I clicked on their website last night, it was an appeal for money came up for so, Cindy, I really want to thank you. I, I think um, I took away three lessons. Um, the first is the importance of the patient voice and not as the token representative, but to, to do it broadly and figure out ways to capture the diversity. So your approach with cataloging these sorts of things I think is very important. So if you're doing an oncology study, you can touch on this and see what are the lessons to be learned. I think incorporating the patient voice, not just about what studies are interested, what questions are interested, uh, people are interested, what outcomes they're um, interested in, but also the way people are thinking about being a partner. And increasingly, we're getting a sense that the patient as a partner, the yeah. patient communities as a partner, is very important. We're here uh, at Children's talking about incorporating the patient reported outcome into the electronic record, um, thinking about doing that in terms of, um, of our studies, having an element to that. So that's the first major piece. The second major piece, I think, is that there is sort of a learning health system aspect to this. That by learning how to approach patients about studies, we're also learning about how to approach patients about clinical issues. And, and the idea of incorporating residents and fellows into this process, I think, makes us better doctors, better healthcare providers. And, and the final thing, I think, is that one of the hallmarks of research is really the hallmark of scholarship, and that's rigor. It's to sort of not just, well, I'm a smart person, I kind of see this. I'm going to just sort of go with my gut. Guts are good as a starting point, but doing something rigorously, using both qualitative and quantitative methods to, to, to address an issue so that you really have an evidence base, because at the end of the day, we want to take this out into the community, and doing a pragmatic clinical trial actually really involves that you know what you're doing and with whom you're doing it. So I really want to thank you for coming and sharing this with you, with us. I think that there will be some of us that will be very interested in being yet another sort of node in this network. Yeah. Um, so thanks for your talk. Yeah, we welcome that.